This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 384, recorded on April 8th, 2016. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. How are you doing today, Dixon? Well? Doing good. It's really cold out. I'm doing good. And isn't that so And bad. windy. Windy, yes. Bloody wind. Yeah. Winter is back. It's No, it's it's a typical spring day now. Nah, We're just not used to warmer. it. We had flowers in December. Also joining us from North Central Florida, I think Rich Condit. That's me, and I am in North Central Florida. That's correct. You have 80 uh, degrees I'm, there? Well, I'm uh, trying to. Uh, well, it's gorgeous. I can tell you that. Uh, 70, 80 degrees. Very good. 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, clear blue sky. We had a couple of puffy clouds. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's a good time of year. All right. We don't want to hear from you anymore. Okay. Right. I won't say anymore. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it's uh, it's blustery. Yeah, it is blustery. 49 Fahrenheit, winds are southwest at 21, gusting to 30. <laughs> yeah. The blustery day. Wasn't that a uh, Winnie the Pooh thing or something? Oh, it might have been. Might have been. All right, we have two guests in studio today. One of them has been back, is coming back for, oh, he's been here many times, and the other is brand new, but they are both from the Center for Infection and Immunity here at Columbia University of Medical Center. We have Ian Lipkin. Welcome back, Ian. Pleasure to be here. Like fifth or sixth time. But who's counting? Who's counting? <laughs> and a first-time appearance. He is an associate research scientist in the Center for Infection and Immunity. Nishay Mishra, welcome. Uh, thanks. Good to be here. First time on TWIV. Hopefully not the last time. I hope not. <laughs> how, long, uh, how long have you been in the Center for Infection and Immunity? Uh Ian, don't say too long. <laughs> <laughs> Close to five years. Now. Five years. Yeah, I've never seen you before. Oh, wow. I was in lab all the time. You're in the lab. Good. <laughs> all That's the great time. It's your day in and day out. Yeah, weekends. You told them what to say. <laughs> holidays. <laughs> before you were here, uh, where were you? Uh, I finished my PhD from India, mm -hmm. and then after finishing my PhD, I was here the next day. Really? Yeah. Wow. Well, that's good. Yeah. Came right up, right here. And you've been here ever since. Excellent. And uh, what would you say your training is? Are you a virologist? I'm, I'm a virologist. I did my PhD from National Institute of Virology, Pune. Mm -hmm. And there I've been uh, trained for BSL-3 and uh, like outbreak response. Mm -hmm. And I did my PhD in viral hepatitis. Mm -hmm. And then after that, my training was on and on. So I was still learning from Ian and lab a lot. Yeah. You love it here? Great. It was been good. All right. Yeah. Uh, hey, Vincent, yes, uh, Nisei's, Nisei's volume seems a little low to me anyway. Oh, you, I can fix that. Nisei, can you count to five? Five, four. Three. Oh, yeah, much better. Great. I boosted See, your this channel. is part of the problem. What's that? You asked him to count to five, and he went he started five, backwards. four, three, two, one. <laughs> but we'll get it right. <laughs> well, you, I didn't think that was a problem. I liked it. I thought it was creative. <laughs> Maybe he just wanted to be funny. He's, he's an independent thinker. Right. Exactly, exactly. All right, so you guys are here because we published a cool paper um, about fish. In fact, the virus that infects fish. And it just came out in MBio. And uh, I like this. When Ian sent me the paper, he goes, look, classic virology. Because I guess no one would associate you with classic virology these days, right? These days. I know in the old days you were a classic <laughs> virologist. But nowadays uh, you do modern stuff. You do nucleic acid-based investigation. He's 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 gonna die. He's passing Got palpitations out. <laughs> here. <laughs> All right, you don't have to answer. The paper is called "Characterization of a Novel Orthomyxo-like Virus Causing Mass Die-Offs of Tilapia." Oh my goodness! I have to say it's not my favorite fish, but I understand a lot of the world needs tilapia, right? It's a big food source. It is. It is like it is cheap. It is big protein source in like developing countries, and the, it's easy to farm. So yeah. it's a very important fish. So the biggest producer is China, Egypt, Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, Laos, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Colombia, and Honduras. So India is not up there. Wow. Do you farm fish at all in India? Uh, India, like mostly they consume freshwater fish. Freshwater fish, okay. Yeah. 
So these are farmed out in the. Do you know about this? Dick? I know a lot they're about fa- tilapia. They're farmed out in the ocean with a barrier, no, 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 right in the no, they're, inland. They're freshwater. They're freshwater. They originated from Lake Victoria. No wonder I don't like them. From Victoria originally. Freshwater. <laughs> you would find them in lakes. You would. And and the U.S. is the leading importer. And we grow a lot of them here too. So Miche, how did you get involved with this study? Did Ian come to you and say, "I have a project for you"? <laughs> I got all these dead fish. I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> uh, more or less, it was like that. So Ian was contacted by two groups, like on the same time almost, mm-hmm. related, the problem related fish, and the etiology was different. Like one was struggling with the the fish die off in Ecuador. Uh, with the syncytial hepatitis and the other one were like for like brain related symptoms in Israel so both both were caused like looking for the mass die offs mm. and then both started sending us samples back to back and then we start looking into that and the first thing we have screened for a bunch of viruses and then we have done the first round we have done deep sequencing on the mm. tissue sample of fish and after like biomimetic analysis and everything we don't see anything in there that is very unusual. So when uh, you do this mass, you do deep sequencing, you get a lot of sequence. Mm-hmm. You get host in there as well, right? So that that was also a big problem because that time the uh, tilapia host genome was not very well characterized uh, and uh, it has not been very well annotated. And with the fish like different species, they vary their host genome also. Yeah. So yeah. we didn't know much about it. And when... And the, a lot of problem during the library preparation. When we work on the tissue samples, we use RNA depletion, RRN depletion right. with the ribojuro kit. So far in the market, only two kits are available, for one for rodents, other for human. Mm-hmm. Still we use it to deplete the <laughs> RNA as much as we can do. And uh, so we made libraries and we made libraries with uh, tissue samples from Ecuador. We made library tissue samples from the Israel. Mm-hmm. We made lab. So we couldn't find anything. Then we followed up with the culture technique. We started using culture so, virus. Excuse me. When you say you couldn't find anything, does that mean you didn't get any hits that were obviously viral? Uh, we didn't get any hit that we can recognize as viral. Yes. Right. They, okay. Fine. Right. Fine. Because that, that's a theme in this that's really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So then after we... Uh, so. We've been discussing with our collaborator and with Ian and like with our team, bioinformatics, we've been working on this thing. I said, if there is a virus-like particle, there should be some genome sequence. Then we work on the subsection method where we have cultured virus in the E11 cells and we have taken the like knife cell lines also. Mm-hmm. We made libraries on both and the same thing we did with the tissue samples. So you took extracts of fish and you put them on these cultured cells. This is yeah. a fish cell line? They are fish cell line, mm-hmm. and they, the virus is growing now on like four or five cell lines. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is like uh, tilapia brain cell lines, TMB cells, and it can easily grow on E11 cell line, the snakehead virus cell line. Snakehead, that's right, I remember that. Yeah, snakehead <laughs> cell line. So you can take an extract of diseased fish and put it on these cells, and it will kill them, and, and you can see virus particles in the super. Yeah, it, like we get CP in mm-hmm. like 6 to 12 days, and then we can harvest the virus. So you know there's a virus there. You're just having trouble getting sequence out of it. Uh, the first time when we did like the tissue sample, we didn't know there was virus in there. Once we start growing the virus, then we knew there is virus in there. Okay. So mm-hmm. then after we start like... Making libraries first, we dial like dial to Iron Torrent. We couldn't. We thought we have not have enough reads. Then we went to Illumina HiSeq. Mm-hmm. It generated more than two hundred million sequences. Still, we don't see any viral like sequence. And this is from the fish still, right? Not from the, the fish. cells, right? Okay. Fish. And then we moved to this subsection method where we have grown the virus in E11 cells, mm-hmm. and and we have taken the cell like knife cells also, and we made libraries on both and try to subtract reads from one to another. So you, you took the reads of the uninfected cells? Yes. And removed those from the infected cells, yeah. right? Yeah. And then we did the same thing with the tissue also. Right. Where we have so it's, taken like a, it's a massive um, uh, in situ hybridization, but not in situ, or, or, or a subtractive hybridization. That's right. Yeah. It's computational, right? Computational. It's computational, yeah. Yep. yeah. Yep. 
And that doesn't uh, sound like traditional virology to me. Oh, we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get, well, well, they already no, they already cultured it in cells. <laughs> yeah. right? That was right. <laughs> okay, salt. okay, okay. Put it in cells already. That's, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then followed up like same approach with uh, tissue samples, mm -hmm. where we have taken the tissue sample from the infected fish, and we have taken the tissue sample from the un, like the healthy fish. Right. And then we start working on that, and uh, we work together with the uh, New York Genome Center. They help us a lot in this uh, uh, bioinformatics analysis because we have like like big data set, and then they did a lot of bioinformatic tools, and mm -hmm. and then after we subsected the reads, and after subsection, we made the context, and after making context, we have blasted all the reads, like single reads, hundred base pair to those contexts. We made the depth. We got very good depth after that. And mm -hmm. we saw there are like 10 different contexts are present. There are like more than 500 to almost um, 1,700 nucleotide contexts were there. And we were finding the same context in iron torrent library, what we made with the tissue. Mm -hmm. And same context, we were finding what we made with the 11 cells. Then we start mix and matching with each other. What we are looking at the same sequence. Then after we start designing primers, first screening all the samples with those temp like contexts. They were like all the fish, infected fish. They were positive for those eleven, ten contexts. So primers from each of the ten. Each of the ten contexts. Were, yeah. were positive. So, did you start thinking what these ten contexts were at this point, or not yet? First, like once we got, got we got the context, we start blasting it, and blast come up nothing. Nothing. <laughs> So, against the existing viral database. Yeah, right? there are like yeah. almost 4 million viral sequences are available. <laughs> it was not matching with anything. Wow. Not even like, not Blast, Mega Blast, Blast X, <laughs> right. B Blast X, it doesn't match with anything. Uh -huh. Only it has started matching when we do force, one of those 10 segments, when we do force blast. Forced blast. Like, like uh, the limited blast with... Uh, influenza viruses mm -hmm. so one of that segment the biggest one it matches 17 percent amino acid bases so if one one seven 17 percent yeah. so in a forced blast you pick the target that you're blasting against right? yeah so why did you pick flu or were you going through all the viruses because we uh, we could recognize some motifs of polymerase motifs I see. I see those were like matching with influenza virus well we had this multi-segmented virus yeah so we started thinking in terms of what viruses might have multiple segments yeah, yeah. Right. that's why we forced it in that way but so, it was a modest rich it was really a modest relationship at best oh yeah yeah so th this fascinates me because because and what it sounds like to me is that initially in all of your sequencing efforts, what you're coming up with is what we have called historically dark matter. <laughs> <laughs> but you know there's got to be something there, all right? And so with the combined information and the computational subtractions from a number of uh, different sources, you came up with uh, 10 dark contigs, right? That's uh, correct. And With ultimately just a little bit of a sniff of a match with a, a flu. A little bit of a sniff, but there were there were a couple of other clues that came up as well, which I'm okay. sure Nisha is going to get into as he's describing okay. the termini of the context. Yeah. But one of the things I want to say is that, you know, of all the work we've done, probably in 30 years, there are only two instances where we would never have known what we had, but for the classical virological techniques which we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. And the first one was Borna, and the second one was this tilapia lake virus. The other ones are fairly straightforward. And the amount of computational power required to do all the work that Nietzsche is describing, we didn't have access to, mm -hmm. which is why one of the reasons why we began working with the Genome Center, because they have large clusters that you mm -hmm. can access. So why don't you tell them about the termina? Yes. So the first thing, like when we got those 10 contexts, first we didn't know is if they are the segment of the virus. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know like if they are like contexts are representing the same virus, maybe it's a large virus. And um, so first we, then we start doing the race. Once we start doing the race, then we start identifying the sequences of the termini of five prime and three prime. And uh, once we assemble the data, we could see those like termini, 
they are very much similar with each other like a five prime were similar and same by three prime also mm-hmm. and then we start analyzing the more um, copies and the more co- colonies and then it, it doesn't make any difference and then we start comparing the termini with five prime and three prime each other they also look like they can make a like circle like a structure like mm-hmm. afterward when we need mm-hmm. to polymerize right. and that was the time then we designed the primers those are matching like one segment reverse direction one segment forward direction to see they are not connected with each other anyhow so mm-hmm. we have done like all the permutation yeah. combination right. one to right. ten two right. to ten they were not so we couldn't get any band That's the fine. first thing we saw okay so this is terminal segments are like similar like termini so this is segmented virus the segments are not connected because we have confirmed with the pcr so it's a segmented virus then it comes Mm. if it is positive or negative strand virus then we moved on on like very classical virology techniques <laughs> then i had for that i had to read all the good papers from ian and thomas like like 10 15 20 years oh, ago ancient history yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so then we followed up with like northern hybridization and in c2s and other experiments so actually a northern blot in this paper two northern yes. blots That, Hooray for northern blots. I love northern blots. That was blots. extraordinarily difficult. <laughs> yes. So Is that right? Uh, so no one does northern blots that I know anymore. <laughs> so we started calling people up and they're saying, "Are you doing northern blots?" "No, I haven't done one in 20 years." <laughs> and then we talked to some, you know, to Craig Cameron. Uh and he said, "Sure, come on down." So Nishi went down and tried to get that to go and we were unsuccessful there we did some work at the cancer center couldn't get that to go so we had to reestablish the whole process the, you know the process here make all the buffers again and everything else and they are very nice northern blood they're beautiful they are they're great <laughs> you got an infected cell and liver rna and you can see all the segments right yeah. i have to tell you i was a graduate student with peter palazzi in the 70s mm-hmm. and this terminal redundancy that you're talking about that the ends can make a little uh, double stranded structure that was discovered while I was there you know how long it took them to sequence just the the 20 bases at either end it took uh, almost a year <laughs> you only these chemical methods to do that but i remember that we used to do northern blots all the time yeah it's all forgotten uh northern blots are uh, really underappreciated by the the new generation because they provide structural information that you don't get out of the sequencing that's right And, and you can just look on one block. You can see all the different sizes, That's right. right? Well, yeah. we now have them up and running. Okay. Yeah. Good. So in the event <laughs> right. we need a northern blot, Very good. I'm visiting. Yeah, and, and I don't think we will get that complicated virus to run northern anymore. Like it's That's great. You never know. Never say never. Yeah. That reminds, it, it reminds me a little of um, when uh, somebody in our lab, when I was with Vincent, had uh, some kind of contamination they were trying to track down, and they wanted to do a gram stain, and we discovered that nobody in the Department of Microbiology <laughs> at Columbia had the reagents to do a gram stain. I believe that. Definitely. Nice, really nice. You also did in situ hybridization. Yes, we did in yep. situ hybridization on the tissue samples. Right. We did the in situ hybridization on the cells also. So the, the fish were positive. Oh, and one important result from the insight. The fish were positive in the fish. <laughs> yeah, it was very. Where was the uh, signal in, in the cell? So that was like very good result when we start seeing when we overlap with the DAPI staining the 11 mm-hmm. cells. So like first time when when I, when I did like I harvested cells after like 48 hours I didn't see this kind of results but CP generate like after 5 days when we harvested the cells like the, the fix the cells after 4 days. and we did the in situ hybridization we could see the signal is in nucleus nucleus right so that wow. so it tells you it's likely a flu like virus right yeah right borna also does nucleus right yes it does but, it does. but this is not borna as we know oh well, that's very nice so now these sequences are in pubmed they are so someone could take them and and go through all the data sets where there's unknown stuff and see if there are positive uh, results right certainly if somebody have like the tilapia infected with these virus do you know so you you left out wait a minute you left out one of the classic classic virology What's experiments that? which <laughs> is determining the polarity of the yes thing. okay you know this has been an exam question well not anymore <laughs> but was for forever okay because if it's a negative strand virus oh, the rna means. itself should not be infectious mm-hmm. yeah. uh, if it's a positive strand virus the rna itself should be infectious and so 
you guys did the appropriate transfections and showed that the uh, RNAs were not infectious, uh, implying that it's a negative strand virus. That's classic, classic. Yeah, they, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and they got RNA from virus particles, right? You yes, we did. RNA we, uh, right. And we did the uh, NNV also, the n nervous necrosis virus. Right. That's a positive strand virus. Okay. That's also, in fact, the fish virus. <clears throat> and it's also a stranded virus. So we have tried to mimic mm -hmm. everything like the positive strand RNA virus. That's and good. I'm glad you had a control there, Ian. Every once in a while. <laughs> so what country was this isolated from again? So we're two sites. Well, we can get into discussion of the, the global distribution of this virus, and this is a great segue for that. We received samples from Ecuador and from Israel. When the results were described in Ecuador amongst our collaborators, we were then told about an outbreak in Colombia. Mm -hmm. And so we sent primers and probes to the government of Colombia, and they found that they had, not surprisingly, the same virus. This morning, I was on the phone with another country in the Middle East that doesn't want to be, you know, noted on air, <laughs> where they said they have every summer, they call it summer disease, they lose millions of tilapia. And the pathological... Mm findings are identical to what's been described in Israel. So we know it's in at least five countries now. I presume it's everywhere. Now, this is a fish that is farmed globally, but it originated um, like Egypt or something? Africa. No, like Victoria. Well, it depends on, depends on whether or not you believe the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> So this is... Let's this, say hypothetically, no. So, so well, you know, hypothetically, um, this was referred to as St. Peter's fish. Uh, and if you look right. at, you look adjacent to the gills, you'll see a coin-like um, structure, which is supposed to represent the coins that were, that St. Peter used to pay the tax. These are also supposed to be the fish that Jesus used to feed the multitudes. Presumably... Those fish then were in better shape than these are now. <laughs> but, but the density with which they farm these uh, fish and the yeah, fact that they, they irrigate with, you know, with water, which is really funky, and that goes right. then into the tilapia ponds. I do not eat tilapia myself. Uh, maybe <laughs> if they cleaned it up, I'd consider it. But the fact of the matter is a lot of people do. It's a big industry. It's huge. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the tilapia farming in the United States, at least, is uh, hooked up to aquaculture, which uses plants uh, to receive the nutrients from the waste products from the fish, right. cleans up the water, the water and then goes back to the tilapia. So um, maybe you would eat the tilapia that gets the fresh water back to Ian, but not the ones that... <laughs> if I were to show you some of the pictures... No, no, I know. Seen, it's pretty gross. It's really gross. Pretty gross well, what, stuff. I, what I was getting at, though, is this could be... Um, you know, a virus that has been in these fish for a very, very long time, right? We don't know. It, okay. And what about yeah, other... I mean, how, can, how can you do a phylogenetics on it? It's got no matches. It's in. got no matches, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about other f fish farming? I mean, a lot of other freshwater fish species are being farmed, particularly cyprinoids in uh, Asia, you know, carp-like fish. I wonder if they... I know they're not related because they're quite well, different fish. As you say, um, now that people are doing... Now that people have access to these mm -hmm. sequences in the database, right. my prediction is that there we, we will find yeah. similar so, viruses. Yeah. Yeah. So in the introduction, it sounded to me as if the uh, disease symptoms that are described in the outbreak in Israel are different than the disease symptoms described in the outbreak in Ecuador, uh, and yet the agent seems to be the same. Do I have that right? You do have that right. And we don't have an explanation for that. The viruses okay. are extraordinarily similar. There are small differences, but they may be large. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we just don't know. Uh, because there hasn't been a lot of interest, frankly, in doing pathogenesis studies. These are very cheap fish. And now we're talking about what do we do next? So unlike salmon where, you know, you can make an argument for direct injection of these fish, we're trying to come up with very inexpensive ways in which you can immunize them as mm. bolts mm. by bathing them in various solutions. 
Why, why is it okay to inject salmon but not these fish? Nobody wants to. It's just a question of expense. It takes a lot of money. It's a lot of work. Salmon, mm-hmm. then you, do you get a lot more money. Yeah. Okay. Tilapia, or, yeah, yeah, you know. Hmm. Dime a dozen. So are you guys or working? St. Peter's coin a dozen. Are you working on that, or is that some, for something else? Yeah, so we're, we're working on, so we're trying to understand a few things. We have some hints about whether or not certain, pro, certain gene segments might encode glycoproteins that would mm-hmm. be candidates for subunit vaccines. Uh, and at the same time, uh, Avi and, and Aaron are trying to uh, develop an attenuated mm-hmm. virus vaccine. Attenuated virus vaccines are a little trickier uh, because, you know, USDA is not excited about them for the most part because once they get out, they're, they're out. Yeah, yeah. So we're probably going to focus on, uh, a di- you know, one of the, uh, one of the subunit vaccines. Or what, what about vaccine. the stages of the fish? What, what stage is most susceptible? A larval, adult, intermediate stages? I mean, it, they're fast-growing fish, so. <laughs> we don't know. Does it kill them all, or does it just kill the adults, or does it? So, so What's so the economic it, loss, in other words? I think it starts infecting the, this virus starts infecting the fish, like when they're in the stage of fry. And uh, the Ecuadorian partner, we have done most of the work on the fry. And the Israeli partner, we have done most of the work on adult fishes. Got it. Right. So and is based, there... It, based on figure three, I mean, there, I see a lot of dead adult fish along this um, yeah, right. shoreline. So is it a slow developing virus? Good question. Right. Infects quick. in the fry and then kills them as adults? So the figure three you see there, that picture was taken from Israel. Mm-hmm. Right. So uh, we, we, we presume they are the same pictures for the fry also in uh, Ecuador, but we don't have that picture right now. Yeah. Mm. Okay. There you go, Dixon. Wow. Sad for uh, you to see that, right? Very. So, so I, you must have uh, looked for something that looked like a hemagglutinin or a neuraminidase, <laughs> you talk about cleavage sites and uh, uh, other motifs. Do you, do you, is there anything that looks like an HA or a neuraminidase? No. Hmm. Dang. <laughs> Up to mm. our, our knowledge, is nothing is like that. Like It's uh. completely new. Transmembrane domain? No. Hmm. What about a connection between tilapia and birds that feed on tilapia? So that's... Um, there's speculation about how this virus is getting around the world. So yeah. one possibility is that people start up new ponds at various locations and bring the infection with them. Mm-hmm. Right. But the other point that Dixon just raised is an alternative hypothesis. And birds feeding on this fish might, in the course of their migration, yeah. drop it in other yep. areas. Yep. And it, it may be both. For I, I mean, you said influenza virus. That's a bird thing right sure so why not this sure very good so looking in herons and stuff like that maybe they're shooting birds of various sorts the nih is very excited about this finding and they want us to to shift all of our resources into tilapia farms Ah, this has (laughs) huge huge economic because yeah absolutely you know forget about zika and (laughs) and (laughs) let's work on tilapia okay so um, this is you think this is a new genus in the influenza family in the orthomyxoviridae, right? Yeah, it is. It is. Like I think it's like new virus, and it's a new genus. But uh, let's ICTV decide on that. Yeah, right. So you are you going to submit this to the ICTV? That's something you have to do, right? Yeah, we will do that. Like, okay. Yeah. All right. And then there's also influenza D, right? Which is just another influenza virus, A, B, C, D. Do you know about that? Yeah, I miss, I, I read the paper. Yeah, yeah. All right. And uh, are you continuing to work on this, or have you moved on to other things? Oh, I'm parallelly working on other things when I was working on that. Uh, yeah. So, but still, we will follow up the vaccine strategy, and All we right. will follow up with like better diagnostic techniques, and uh, give it to other people if they need it. I'm, I'm still working on other projects. Do you plan to stick around a while here at the CII? Yes. Yeah, Ian is showing hands up. He's yeah. showing thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I guess you are. <laughs> So nearly seven years ago in TWIV 41, we did an episode on uh, that included infectious salmon anemia virus, which yes. was another yes. orthomyxovirus of fish. And you mentioned this uh, uh, in this virus in your paper, and it has no 
uh, no cross or no homology mm-hmm. to uh, your new tilapia virus, right? Yes. Um, uh, are there other orthomyxoviruses of fish that have been described? In fact, like these fish, like a farm fish, they're supposed to be like virus free. <laughs> so they're like right. this is like second virus when I'm first one in salmon that ISAV yeah, and yeah. second in tilapia, this TILV we found. And there may be other viruses, but like a lot of work has not been done on like virus discovery on fish. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, There's a lot of pancreatic necrotic disease in mm-hmm. trout uh, husbandry as well. So. It uh, can wipe out an entire hatchery worth of fish. Right. But it's hard to get grants for this sort of thing because nobody wants to fund a fishing expedition. Exactly. Oh. That's exactly correct. That's right. Oh. It's exactly correct. Right. He's been holding that one. Yes. <laughs> I've just, it's been waiting. <laughs> Gentlemen, anything else uh, that we missed that we should mention? Not on this, this story. So one last question. When I'm right in assuming there, there are no outbreaks in the United States yet? No. Hence... The fear that there may be. Yeah. That's why they want to fund it. No, they don't want to fund it. They don't. He was kidding. <laughs> he was kidding. <laughs> but the, oh. the U.S. isn't a huge producer, right? No, it's not. We're a consumer. Consumer, yeah. yeah so. There is one thing I would like to mention that's sure. off topic. Uh, and your audience could get involved mm-hmm. in doing something about this. The MMR vaccine story has resurfaced. Oh, yes. Has resurfaced. And my hate mail oh, no. since publishing an editorial on this where we described the efforts we took to replicate Andrew Wakefield's work and failed. Uh, not only did we fail, but his laboratory people failed. Uh, is, uh, you know, it's running pretty hot. Mm-hmm. So if, you know, if you have an opportunity to educate people, um, please do so. Because it's very important that kids get vaccinated. Yes. So we have a a friend at Johns Hopkins in Diane Griffin's lab, uh, Nina Martin, and she went to see the movie and went to the press conference afterwards and filmed Wakefield telling lies, as she put it. She's going to come on the show in a couple of weeks and tell us about the movie and what he said afterwards and so forth. Good. And uh, But your, your editorial is fabulous. It's, uh, yeah, it was really, really nicely done, Ian. I really yes. like it. I, I appreciate that. So Bob De Niro uh, was open to hearing about mm-hmm. the other side of this, and uh, um, he was persuaded to pull it, but he didn't say exactly what we hoped he would say. He said it was, you know, it was shifting too much emphasis away from the festival and its other offerings to this personal issue. Mm. But... Um, you know, he's, he's not, you know, he's changing his mind a bit and we're discussing now other things. And if I could share with you some of my, uh, mm-hmm. email, which I won't, it's quite extraordinary. I may show it to you offline. Okay. Uh, so, uh, we kind of jumped into this Let for anybody who's not familiar with this. Let's make sure we got the background. So, uh, Andrew Wakefield, who is infamous for, having stirred up this notion that the MMR vaccine is associated with uh, autism, uh, an idea that has been thoroughly uh, discredited. Uh, and directed, which, was, which he generated as part of a vast fraud, as a matter right. of fact. Uh, has uh, produced and directed a what he calls a documentary film uh, that uh, um, basically resurrects this idea and uh it was slated for showing at the tribeca film festival um and there was an uproar over that and robert de niro who founded that festival and originally advocated showing the film uh uh thankfully changed his mind on it and pulled it but it has since been shown in new york is that right yes it's showing at an art cinema uh, on uh, for those of you who know Lower Manhattan, it's a very okay. trendy part of town. Right. And it's at the Angelica, right? It's at the Angelica. Yeah, and absolutely. originally it was going to be a week with six showings a day. The first two days there was a, a panel discussion mm-hmm. where Wakefield and uh, Del Bigtree, who is the producer, were there to answer questions. And uh, Phil Arusa, who's on faculty here, went to that first showing and wrote up his thoughts 
for the Guardian, and he was attacked uh, and called a pederast and all kinds of other things. I don't know how they jump from that one thing to the next, but gives you an idea of what the male looks they like. They jump from one thing to another what thing the male all the looks time. Like. <laughs> and, and now it's been extended for another week, and it's opening up another film festival in Florida, in Ocala, Florida, something called the Silver Spring Festival. So, you know, maybe you can catch it there. Jeez. I saw, I looked at the trailer and that was enough. So, was- so this, this fellow Thompson, who's the quote unquote whistleblower claims in the emails that traffic that I've seen that, um, that we met one another and discussed the strategy for the study. I have no recollection of that at all. Number two, he claims that we got halfway through the study. And then I said, I wanted more money and that if I didn't get it, that I was going to go to my congressman. So I was very curious as to how that works because really? my congressman has never given me a grant. <laughs> but apparently, that's the way it works, Vince. Well, uh, just out. give it a shot. Uh, and there were some other things which are quite extraordinary as well. So uh, they're not going away anytime soon. But I think the people who listen to this podcast are educated and in a position to have conversations with their their friends and colleagues who don't believe in vaccination. Yeah. Uh, so the other thing that we uh, sort of implied but didn't state is that um, Ian wrote a, an editorial for the Wall Street uh, Journal uh, covering this whole thing and with the background. And uh, it's, it, it's really good because it describes the whole uh, history of the thing and the investigations that were done to debunk it and it's really nicely written so if you need fodder for your educational efforts uh, that's a wonderful uh, uh, resource and we'll put that in the show notes alright thank you Ian Gentlemen. thank you thank you Nishay thank you, Ver- Nishay, thank you so <laughs> thank much thank you very much we'll, we'll have you back at your next discovery sure <laughs> alright exactly this episode of TWIV is also sponsored by ASM, the grant writing course. Grad students, postdocs, and early career scientists, you, we invite you to apply for the ASM, the American Society for Microbiology grant writing course. You learn how to write a grant. They will not teach you how to get it, but you'll learn how to write one because no one knows how to get them. You will get personalized feedback on your grant proposal. You'll get hands-on experience during an intensive two-and-a-half-day course at Headquarters of ASM in Washington. This is August 12th through the 14th. The deadline to apply, June 30th. Go to bit.ly slash GWC16. They'll cover how to talk to your congressman, too. (laughs) Get a grant from your congressman. Yeah, that's right. right. Do people actually think that's how it works? Some Some people, I guess, must think that. In the past, it used to work like that, believe it or not. Really? Yep. There were some grants given out like that. All right, now. I'll I'll (laughs) give my grant writing advice, which is to state exactly what you're going to do in the first sentence of the project description so that I don't have to read anything else. (laughs) (laughs) Dixon, do you remember, just one more diversion, do you remember what, um, who was the the C. Elegans guy who won the Nobel Prize from the UK? Sidney Brenner. Sidney Brenner Brenner. said, here's how, this is what makes up a grant. (laughs) Half of the experiments you've already done and half you will never do. (laughs) <laughs> that's right. A grant application, that is. That's right. That's right. You're getting right. paid for experiments you've already done. I thought we would talk now a little bit about dengue vaccines. Nice. I'm amazed that there's so many. Uh, we've talked about one that's licensed uh, in various countries and has been, uh, we talked about a little bit with S. Burkalis last time, but there are others in, in trials, many, many more, and it's really interesting. Yeah. So and the reason there are so many more is because the one <laughs> that's in use <laughs> It's not so hot. Yeah, right? it turns out it's not so hot. Right. And we, I think we talked about the one that's out there. This, it's made by Sanofi. It's called CYD, Chimeric Yellow Fever uh, Dengue Vaccine, or um, what's the Dengue Vax? Uh, what's the name of it? I, I Dengvaxia. Dengvaxia. And uh, it's been licensed in quite a few countries. It is basically, they took the yellow fever virus vaccine, yeah. which was, man, originally developed by Max Tyler. Noticed. Okay. That's right. A long time in, ago, right? In the 40s. 40s. Right. In fact, he got a Nobel Prize for it. The first 
to make a, an attenuated infectious virus vaccine. I think he passaged yellow fever virus in chick embryos many, many times, mm. right? Mm. And selected the classical them. way, the classical way of making an attenuated yeah. vaccine. Yep. And uh, that was eventually licensed and used uh, extensively. And then when dengue rears its head, as we get rid of DDT and dengue rears its head and so forth, uh, and it's a global problem, Sanofi said, and others, others have done this too. Uh, let's take the dengue virus backbone and stick in uh, proteins from dengue viruses. And of course, so let's let, take the yellow, yellow fever. fever what did I say? What you said dengue, dengue. dengue. You, said, you meant to say yellow fever, dengue. Yeah, yellow fever. And of course, that's made possible because you can make a DNA clone of the dengue uh, genome. And they're both flaviviruses. They're both too. flaviviruses, and they have a similar genome structure. Exactly. And you can swap out DNA fragments, and then. In an amazing thing, you can actually get virus by transfecting cells awesome, Dave. with this DNA or with RNA derived from it. Awesome. Isn't that amazing, Dixon? It's cool. amazing. <laughs> just amazing. So, so just, to, just to emphasize here, because you've got this nice cartoon in the, sh <laughs> in the show notes, and we've been talking about flaviviruses and all that stuff. Let's make sure everybody understands that this is a single-stranded positive RNA virus Okay, that it makes a polyprotein, right? Yep, it and, does. Uh, gets processed much the same as polio and stuff, though. In the uh, the the virion is has a capsid protein and a membrane around that, and then structural proteins uh, protruding from that. And all of these viruses that we've been talking about: yellow fever, uh, uh, chick, um, dengue, <laughs> Zika. Yeah. Right? And West Nile. Relevant. West Nile. Uh, West Nile. They're all flaviviruses. Well, chick is, very chick similar. Is sorry, oh, chick chick's not. Chick's an chick alpha. Is chick's an alpha. Uh, chick's an alpha. Right. Sorry. Um, but dengue, um, uh, yellow, fever. yellow fever, West Nile, Zika, Zika all have this same structure. If you just look at the cartoon, it's obvious that you should be able to swap it. It's going to be more complicated than this, but you should be able to swap in and out the structural proteins and exchange them around. That's right. So the basic idea was let's revisit this classic vaccine, and the yellow fever vaccine is, is very good. Um, yeah. So the, the idea was let's just revisit this, put swap in structural proteins from, uh, from dengue, and get a dengue vaccine. And they did for certain values of success. And in right. fact, predating that, that same platform that's called Chimerivax uh, was used in the same strategy to make a vaccine for Japanese encephalitis, mm -hmm. right, which is also licensed. Okay? Right. Exactly the same strategy, uh, Japanese encephalitis being another uh, flavor virus. That's right. So here's some of the data on, the, on, the, on this dengue vaccine, the chimeric vaccine. The efficacy... So what they do is they immunize people in regions that are at risk for dengue, and then they have a control group, and then they follow the two populations and see who, how much dengue there is in each one. So it's naturally acquired dengue. Uh, efficacy was against symptomatic dengue. It was 30% in a phase 2B study in Thailand, 60% in a phase 3 study in Latin America. But two trials done in Asia, <laughs> no protection against symptomatic dengue type 2. There are four serotypes of dengue. Yeah. Uh, even though after immunization, over 95% of the recipients seroconverted. So go figure. Uh, in both regions, uh, the vaccine showed strong protection against hospitalization and severe dengue. So that's good. Mm -hmm. However, uh, in both phase 3 trials, the vaccine didn't afford protection in people who were dengue naive before vaccination. Now, they have had now some long-term data because it's been around for a while. Year three, the risk of hospitalization is actually higher in vaccine recipients compa compared with placebo in subjects less than nine years of age, and the, the risk is highest in kids two to five years of age. Hmm. And remember, so with dengue, you've got this, um, this enhancement effect where if you get infected with one, one serotype uh, and get over it, and then you get infected with a second serotype, you can end up with a worse disease than you would have had if you hadn't had the first one. That's right. That's and it's right. possible that this uh, increased risk of hospitalization might be stemming from that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So you need a vaccine that gets all four of them and does it well. Yes. Exactly. So the first disease is known as breakbone fever, mm -hmm. right? and the second disease is hemorrhagic. So this vaccine has been licensed in Mexico, the Philippines, and Brazil. 
but it's been only licensed in nine years old to 45 years of old because of the kids getting more mm. serious disease and less efficacy in the less than nine year old, which is too bad because there are a lot of kids at risk, right? That's a huge proportion <laughs> of the at-risk population, yes. The other issue with this vaccine is that the regimen involves three doses six months apart, which eh, it's not great. You'd rather have one, right? Correct. Yeah. It's especially in countries with not a lot of resources. So, and so, this is not this is not a quick couple of drops on the tongue like a polio vaccine. You you got to get a shot three times. That's right. It's that's a shot it. exactly. So you need to have needles. You need to have health care personnel know what they're doing. And, and those then, have to come together on three occasions. And then the people have to come back and bring their yep. kids. Yeah, it's Correct. hard. So there are other vaccines being developed. And I, frankly, I was really unaware of this. And it's amazing. This has been going on for over twenty years at the NIH that they've been working on uh, dengue vaccines, yeah. looking at dozens of candidates, and uh, they're actually not just <laughs> make. they're not using chimeras, they're using dengue virus and making changes in the genome that are appropriate, we'll talk about in a moment. And many of these have been through preclinical and phase one, which is safety testing. Uh, they've looked at dozens of strains, and they've narrowed it down to a single representative of each of the four serotypes that looks good in terms of safety uh, and immunogenicity. And there is a tetravalent infectious attenuated formulation, which is called TV003, which has recently gone into phase three clinical testing. And it, so far it looks good. And one of the papers we'll, we'll look at today is a, is a, a 12-month dosing study. So, so this, instead of taking Tyler's vaccine and using <clears throat> modern techniques to modify it, these people are taking Tyler's general approach and using modern yeah, techniques to modify that's it right. and mm -hmm. just, just testing various um, mutation strategies and camerization strategies to see if they can get attenuated viruses. Mm -hmm. So TV03 is a mixture of four uh, candidate viruses. They're, they're, you know, they have names, but all of them have um, serotypes 1, 2, 3, 4. And they all have a deletion in the... Uh, Three prime non-coding region, and Rich will tell us more about those in a minute. This vaccine has been given to 100 Flavi virus naive adults in three uh, U.S. clinical trials, and it induced the tetravalent antibody response in 74 percent of the subjects. And in each of those trials, they got 92, 76, 97, and 100 percent of the subjects seroconverting to all four dengue serotypes. Right. So the 76% is for dengue 2, which has always been the hard one. It is. So the paper I had originally picked, and then as I reviewed it, I got more and more and found many other cool papers, um, is a uh, dosing study. Maybe, um, Rich, you could tell us, can you, can you tell us a little bit about TV003? Uh, I will try and tell you a little bit about uh, TV003. Because I kind of got into it too, but the literature is vast. It is. <laughs> and most of it comes from what I'm going to assume is the laboratory of Stephen Whitehead at the NIH. He is the, right. uh, he is the um, PI on uh, most of these studies. And as you've uh, already said, Vincent, they've been working on this for decades. And they started out from what I can tell, with the traditional approach of passaging virus in culture and uh, trying to get attenuated viruses out the other end. And that had really only modest success in terms of producing good vaccine candidates. But I'm sure from sequence analysis of those things, they got some insights into what are attenuating mutations. And then another approach that they took, then along came the opportunity to work with a cloned virus so they can uh, have cDNA clones of virus and now they can engineer the cDNA clones. And they did uh, mutagenesis, uh, actually they did mutagenesis of uh, uh, infected cells with chemical mutagens, but they also did clustered charged alanine mutagenesis where you identify charged amino acids and change them to alanine, all in cloned virus. And they say, you know, it's, it's cleaner. Okay, because you know what you're doing and you get out uh, easily genetically uh, pure populations. And I, th my sense is that out of a number of those studies, they came up with um, uh, a library of knowledge about attenuating mutations. But the thing that this seems to distill out of all of this that's the most important that was first um, described, I believe, in the Dengue 4 
uh, virus is this dengue for Delta 30 that you've already talked about, which is a uh, about a 30, I guess it's a 30 nucleotide deletion in the three prime non-coding region of the dengue for genome, and uh, that uh, I guess by itself seems to be a really good attenuating mutation. Mm. And so what they've done is to incorporate by various means that same mutation into um, the three other serotypes. In the Dengue 1, they have actually uh, built that same deletion into the Dengue 1 genome. I believe that's the case. In the Dengue 3, they actually swapped the Dengue 3 3 prime end for the Dengue 4 delta 33 prime end, and they've added another deletion here that's called 31. That's next to delta 30 that's another multiple nucleotide deletion and in the case of the dengue 2 uh, vaccine uh, they've taken the dengue 4 delta 30 platform and much the same as Camerivax, they've removed the dengue 4 structural proteins and put in the dengue 2 structural proteins that you know, is interesting because Dengue 2 has been the lame one in the vaccines that have gone by so right. far. So it could be that using the Dengue 4 platform and putting in the Dengue 2 structural proteins is, is important in making that right. At any rate, the bottom line is that all four of these contain that three prime end uh, uh, deletion. One of them is actually a chimera of the Dengue 4 mm -hmm. and uh, Dengue 2 and the other uh, two or three have it uh, built in. Right. So this um, this one paper, which is in G Journal of Infectious Diseases, it's called the 12-month interval dosing study in adults indicates that a single dose of NIAID tetravalent dengue induces a robust neutralizing antibody response. Well, that really is the whole <laughs> the result there, right there. We're done. All right, moving on. <laughs> well, boom. <laughs> 48 adults, uh, dengue negative uh, to begin with. Gave and this it. is, um, uh, first author is Anna Durbin, senior author yes. Stephen Whitehead. And Stephen Wade was, Anna, Anna Durbin is also on many of many of these papers. papers. They're right. Yeah, and um, Kanta Subaro is on this as well. We talked about her flu papers before. Stephen Whitehead was mentioned by uh, Esper Callis last week. Uh, by the way, Esper Callis was uh, just a, a a wonderful guest. I really oh, enjoyed you. that good. episode. It was really good, and he mentioned uh, TV. Double O five, right? Okay. right. I, mean, I don't even know what's I don't know in what that. that is. Yep, I haven't looked that up. So in this paper, basically forty eight adults, uh, they give them a, uh, a dose of this tetravalent TV O three. Uh, they measure, you know, vaccine virus uh, in them. They measure antibody responses. No significant adverse effects. Uh, a year later, they give them a second dose. The second dose, there's no vaccine virus replication. There's no enhancement of antibody, excuse me, antibody responses. So no viremia. Um, and basically they say you don't need a second dose. This is a good one dose vaccine. Okay. And I thought this was really a cool aspect of using um, an attenuated vaccine is that the second dose is essentially a challenge. Yes. Yes. That's right. <laughs> so you know, obviously, with a virus like dengue, you can't go and do a, a challenge study. No. You well, yes, hurt. you can. Well, well you we're can. Gonna get you to can. That. We're going to get to that. Yes, you can. But <laughs> um, you know, rather than inject them with with actual virulent dengue virus, um, you just give them another dose of the vaccine and see how it goes. That's and right. Right. That's right. They see that the second dose, the attenuated virus, can't even get a foothold. Now, uh, there's an, accompany an accompanying uh, uh, commentary by Francis Ennis and, and another individual who I'm forgetting at the moment. Alan Rothman. Alan Rothman. And they say, this is good, but, you know, remember, protecting against the vaccine is different from protecting against yes. real dengue. So, <laughs> obviously, now they have to go and do a, uh, a real study in an, in an at-risk uh, population, which is what they're going to do now. Yes. Um, but meanwhile... All right, so we had gotten um, an email from Bob about this and wanted to uh, us to explain it. So that's what we're working on, Bob. So here's the cool thing. Now, you have this TV003, right? And one thing you could do is go into a endemic population, a lot of people where there is dengue, and try it. But if it makes disease worse, like CYD did 
it's not so good. So how right. can you find out ahead of time if if that's the case? And so they said, uh, let's try and make a human challenge study. All right. Now uh, <laughs> they have a virus which is a uh, it was actually a um, vaccine candidate which failed at one point in a trial. It was uh, not sufficiently attenuated, but um, it's got it's got too many side effects, right? It's got too, too many, many side, adverse effects. Too many adverse effects, right? But it's good enough for a challenge, right? So this this virus called recombinant dengue two D thirty. It was a type. It was a serotype two um, uh, vaccine strain, um, which th- is important because that's the one that everybody seems to have a hard time vaccinating against. Right. right. So they said, let's use this as a, a challenge virus for a dengue two uh, vaccine. So there is a paper, uh, another one now. It is also this is in um, Science Translational Medicine. The live attenuated dengue vaccine TV03 elicits. Complete protection against dengue in a human challenge model. So the vaccine is TV003, which is what we've talked about, and they challenge with this this failed type two uh, dengue strain. And the, the so it's a six month uh, after immunization challenge. It's injection, and the endpoint is primary endpoint is viremia. All right, not disease. And they say it's a little easier on the on the um, people who are in this trial just to look for. Uh, viremia rather than having a a virus that's going to make serious disease because if if you do that they have to be hospitalized and observed and this way you can let them walk around and come in when you need them so it's a randomized double blind placebo controlled trial 21 recipients uh, uh, with 21 people got um, the vaccine and when they were challenged none of them developed viremia rash or neutropenia and 100% of the 20 placebo recipients developed viremia, 80% rash, 20% neutropenia. So, right. so six months after vaccination, all this happens. Nice protection. So um, so you may ask, why uh, is this so much better, supposedly or apparently, than CYD? And, and you know, I never thought of this, but we don't really know the <laughs> what are the correlates of protection for dengue. Exactly. Right? exactly. Yeah, I didn't realize this. We're not sure if it's antibody or cell-mediated immunity, or both. So, And they speculate in, uh, I think it's the Rothman uh, Ennis article, you know, if you have dengue stuck into yellow fever virus, you can have antibodies against the glycoprotein, but all the cellular epitopes, the, the CTL, the CD8 cell epitopes, are gone from the dengue part there, whereas the, their viruses have all the dengue protein. So you're going to get a strong uh, cellular response, and maybe that's really important. Right. And I had not realized this, of course, I, should have I think this is a this has been a common theme, at least in my experience in vaccine development, is is trying to identify the proper immunological correlates of protection because people right. measure what they can, yes. right. and typically right. they measure antibody and say, oh, the antibody goes up, you know, so that must be good, but that's well, not necessarily what's going to protect you. And it's no it's no coincidence that the golden age of vaccinology in the 1950s and 60s. Um, we was hitting all the viruses where antibodies are protective. Right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Because you can measure right. antibodies and they turn out to be protective against yeah. measles, mumps, rubella, you know, yada, 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 polio. Um, and that's all great. And then you reach the end of all those and now you're stuck with the viruses that we don't know the correlates of immunity. So for comparison, TV003, um, I told you the seroconversion rates, right? 76, right. 92, et cetera. Single dose of CYD, you get seroconversion in dengue one, eighteen percent. <laughs> dengue two, forty percent. Mm. It's not as good. Mm. This right. one is much better. <clears throat> Isn't that incredible? <laughs> so right. it's uh, more highly infectious. And then on top of that, you, they say when when you have a tetravalent vaccine like TV003, all the CD8 T cell responses, they say end up re- converging to recognize epitopes that are conserved among the four serotypes because you got all four in there and that's mm-hmm. even better. Mm-hmm. So, yes. you know, from the trials uh, that are forthcoming with these, uh, with TV003, uh, we'll see what the correlative protection is because now you can measure both antibody and cellular responses. Mm-hmm. Right. It's really quite nice. Actually, it hadn't occurred to me that the that the difference between CYD and this 
what might be that there are epitopes in the dengue back, backbone yeah. that are not part of the structural proteins that are important in the immunity. Wow. I, I assumed That's it was antibody-based. Frankly, I didn't know that. We didn't know it was if it was antibody or cell-based or, or not. And so, yeah, it makes a big deal. And, you know, Sanofi invested a lot of money in this uh, CY. Sure. Right? Because they figured, ah, oh, we'll pop it into yellow fever and should be okay, but... Well, and so my mm. first reaction to the uh, to the Zika problem was, oh yeah, sure, you can make a Zika vaccine. Me too. You just take yes. the structural proteins and you stick it into Camary vaccine. Yeah. Same as CYD. I would not um, do that. I would not do that if I were. Well, I might try, but I don't know that it's going to work. Well, trying takes you a long time, right? I wonder if you can build this Delta Thirty yeah, right. into the three prime end. That's what I would do. Yeah, for sure. And the other th- the other cool aspect of this. Um, so they use this type 2 dengue as a challenge in this human challenge. It induces viremia in 100% of people who don't have uh, yes. ever seen flaviviruses before. Wow. So they say you can use fewer people to get a really statistically significant finding. Right. And that's really good. And so fewer people, and it, it's only we're only measuring viremia, so you don't need people to be hospitalized and so forth. So this is under... I think it's the phase three of this has already begun in Brazil. Is that right? Uh, is that what Esper said? I think so. Anyway, the, the, the one article I read, they said a phase three is beginning in early 2016 in Brazil. And that'll, um, that will provide the opportunity to validate any putative correlates of protective protection. So I think that's really cool. So this is very exciting. And, uh, I have a feeling that, you know, CYD is licensed and will be used, but uh, as soon as these results are out, it'll probably be replaced. Yes. Now, this is made by NIH, NIAID, right? Um, well, all the research has been done there, yeah. So, I don't I don't think they're going to end up manufacturing it themselves, no. right? So, that will be licensed to some to other companies, I presume, right? Right. Yeah. Right, and maybe, maybe even license it to a few companies. Yeah, that would be a good thing to do. But Sanofi, Sanofi would actually be a logical choice. They're they're huge. They're yeah. one of the few big companies in vaccines, and uh, they have the capacity. So if they are, if you know, if they're interested in this, they could probably pick that up and and replace their uh, CYD vaccine with it. But I don't know. Do you think? So I assume NIH will give it to these companies without charge, right? I assume I don't know what the deal would be structured as. Um, there would probably be, uh, as as a government product, um, I, I don't think they can, yeah, you know, they put can't the screws to them. It, yeah. But they could put stipulations on it, like you can't charge more than so much, you know. <laughs> mm. Or, as I say, they may try to license it to multiple companies so there'd be competition. Not that this is going to be all that lucrative a market. Yep. But. Um, uh, but then again, the customers for this product are pretty much going to be governments as well. So it's, it's there's possible that they could get the uh, WHO involved in this as well. Well, I would assume so. Yes, I used to know a very um, a, a passionate dengue researcher, Scott Halstead, hmm. who worked at the Rockefeller Foundation and uh, supported a lot of the re- early research on this. And he he must be jumping up and down with pleasure to see that they finally made a breakthrough on it. Yeah, it's very exciting. I yeah, think this is very cool. Someone. Sent us a letter, I think it was last year, and um, we carried it on our show notes for a long time, and it was about the dengue CYD trial, I think. Mm. And she was saying, these don't really look that good. I think it was the uh, the year after trial that I mentioned. Mm. She said, yeah, there, you, were a, there were a couple. That, can a couple you talk about this? Couple. And we never did. So I apologize, but here it is. And now we've I think we've got it all together. Mm. Anything we missed, uh, Rich Condit, Alan Dove, Dixon de Pommier? Not that I, well, I think we hit all the all right. high spots, and the paper is open access. Excellent. Look at that. So people can go grab it. Um, this episode is also sponsored by the American Society for Virology. Their annual meeting is going to be held in Blacksburg, Virginia, Virginia Tech, June 2018 through the 22nd. It's run by or organized by XJ Mang and Zach Edelman. The keynote speaker will be Stephen Russell on oncolytic viral therapy and, of course, five days of symposia, workshops, poster sessions, and state-of-the-art lectures. Come listen to Dr. Joe Handelsman talk about leading the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, be part of live TWIV audience, enhance your presentation skills at the Career Development Workshop. And, of course, ASV is having a special Zika virus oral workshop and poster session 
and they've made a call for late-breaking abstracts with a deadline of May 16th. Early registration rates with reduced rates ends on May 20th, so go to ASV.org. You'll find a link to the meeting for more information. We'll see you all there. God, I wonder how many late-breaking Zika abstracts they'll get. <laughs> Not a lot. Hundreds. Hundreds, hundreds. Yep. Uh, okay, now uh, I actually have a uh, yellow fever um, vaccine story, a brief one. The yellow. Um, the, the link I put in. There's an autoplay video. Be careful. All right. The, the link I put in doesn't work. Why isn't it working? It for didn't me? work for me the previous time, and I clicked it just now, and it suddenly worked. So I, I got it now. Yellow server. fever Jeez. outbreak. Oh, page not found. It, it's a Stat News article. Uh, it's it's called Yellow Fever Outbreak. Um, Sitting on a time bomb. Something Outbreak like of yellow fever setting off alarms. I can't read it, Alan. So Where is okay, the so I've, I've got it here. They've got an autoplay video at the top, <laughs> um, which is, um, by the way, bad web design, people, if you're listening. Uh, and um, the, there's this yellow fever outbreak in Central Africa, uh, oh. and it has taken off and consumed the, uh, essentially consumed the whole world stockpile of um vaccine yellow fever vaccine because of yes. course there were these stockpiles of vaccine in case this happened and now they've rushed in and they've vaccinated as many people as they could and that we we don't have any more vaccine to go around this is angola is that right uh angola i think it has spread to other countries now let's see started in angola how many yeah. cases are we talking about on the december um most recent reports from the WHO, 450 people infected, 178 dead. And um, so p people infected in Angola have made their way to Kenya, Mauritania, Democratic Republic of Congo, and China. Hmm. Um, so the WHO sent its entire vaccine stockpile, 6 million doses, and Angola has a population of 20 million people who they would like to vaccinate. Just the city of Luanda has 7.2 million. So 6 million doses for 7.2 million people just in that city. And they've distributed, um, this article says, as of last week, they've vaccinated 5.7 million people. So t read the quote by Dwayne Gubler. Uh, let's see. It's in big letters. They feature it. Oh, yes. Uh, it says, you think SARS was bad? This would make it pale by comparison. I think this is just really ridiculous. That's... Ridiculous, yes. Okay. Now, the author, Helen Branswell, probably had nothing to do with setting it in big type like that, I hope. But, Dixon, this is a yes. mosquito born. And the mosquito is not everywhere, as far as I know, 80s Egypti, right? But it is in a lot of places. It is. But why would he say it's going to be worse than SARS? How would he know? He's just... You're asking me to crawl into his head? No, never you? mind. I'm just complaining, Dixon. <laughs> it's okay. I, I, when I saw it, I said, I really object to this. And they're using it to scare people and get clicks and so forth. It's not really helping the situation. Let's have a calm evaluation. They're load on their poorly balanced server, too. Yeah, and now I can't load because... <laughs> you can't load the page because too many people are clicking Let's on have this. a balanced yeah. discussion of the science. I agree. Okay? I not agree. screaming headlines about half the world is going to die of yellow fever. This is, does nothing... There's no good. We do have a vaccine. Let's ramp it up, okay? Look, I, I, I once attended a, um, a meeting on the West Nile virus the year after it came out, and Dwayne Globler was in the audience, and in fact, he was asked to lead off the discussion. Mm -hmm. And remember, that the West Nile virus is not transmitted by Aedes aegypti primarily. It's mm -hmm. a helix mosquito, and so it's, it's basically out of his realm of expertise. And he began by saying that we don't know anything about West Nile virus. <laughs> <laughs> and sitting in the audience was um, another guy by the name of uh, Doible from the Pasteur Institute. And he had all 23 strains uh, in his uh, freezer, and he sat, sat next to me, and I, ne I never met the guy before, and he just looked at me and he raises his eyebrows. We don't know anything about the West Nile virus. <laughs> I've got 23 complete sequence data on this thing. <laughs> well, it's too bad. So okay. Dwayne Goober is, is, is fond of, of uh, inflammatory statements. Mm, okay. I'll, rem I'll remember to call him if I'm ever writing an article. Yeah, you, like you'll have to get him in touch with uh, in, in <laughs> Singapore. He used to actually... Um, run the Vector Biology Laboratory at Fort Collins for okay. CDC. Well, and um, 
It's enough picking on yeah. Dwayne, probably. Yeah. So probably. Uh, the, the point, though, is that you don't really need to sensationalize this story because this no. is a bad situation. Of course. It really is. This is a this is a nasty virus. It's mosquito borne, so That's it's right. going to go everywhere. That's right. And we've got an effective vaccine for it, and through what I can only characterize as poor planning and bureaucratic stupidity, we don't have enough of that vaccine. Yeah. Right. Thank you. We should right. Have it. And, no and we should have we should have a bigger stockpile, and we should have more production capacity. But nobody apparently wanted to fund that until right. all of a sudden we've got this crisis. And this is how you get yourself sure. into these crises: is because you don't pay attention when people say you need to be prepared. Do we know anything about the ecology of what might have triggered this outbreak? Nope. No, as far I mean, it's, as I been, know. it's been a weird weather year all around the world, so it's right. entirely possible that they right. just had a bumper crop of mosquitoes in a season yeah, like yeah, yeah. or I don't know. Well, it, it jumps from monkeys into people, and right. so it requires a different mosquito to do that, by the way. So monkeys is uh, Hemagogus mosquitoes, and the people, of course, are down, or Aedes aegypti. And the only way that can happen is for an infected monkey to actually encroach into a human environment and give it to the to the eighties Egyptian mosquitoes, which then give it to the people, and that usually okay. triggers an outbreak. So in but this I, case, maybe there's a been a, a higher collection of bushmeat, or who or the heck knows what's going and on. And I don't know what the up to the moment situation is in Angola, but historically, it's been a place that's had a lot of chaos. Sure. No, that's, so I, that's there true. may have been there may have been some kind of turmoil that caused more interaction between. You know, I don't know, people running into the jungle or more bushmeat, as you say. So yeah, 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 that's right. Any of those could have triggered it. Um, it says in the middle of this article that for decades, yellow fever has been mainly seen in jungle settings of sub-Saharan Africa and South America, and that the WHO estimates between 84,000 and 170,000 cases occur each year. I assume right. that's globally. So yeah. it's not like there's no yellow fever around. That's exactly. a pretty, no, that's, true. that's a reasonably big number. That's right. But this must be... Those must be, I suppose, relatively sporadic, and this is yeah. uh, looks more like an outbreak That's in right. a concentrated population. And it's got right. about a 30% mortality rate, which is about right for what you just said. Right. Googler said, Dixon, yeah, a number it's... of factors are combining to create conditions that could let the virus reestablish itself in urban areas, starting with densely populated mega cities with lots of poor people, ideal breeding Grounds for eighties Egypti mosquitoes. He wouldn't. He's not wrong in that. That's true. Yeah. No, no. He's a, he's he's a world recognized expert on eighties Egypti mosquito biology and dengue and yellow fever. Uh, he here, really is. Here it is. Googler said he's been pressing Sanofi t- for years to make more yellow fever vaccine. Yep. Well, why would they listen to him? <laughs> well, and pressing pressing the company is not. That's the right way to go because the yeah. company is in business right. to make money. I mean, yes, they make products that save lives, but they also need to turn a profit. You need to press the buyers to ensure that that would be there. You know, I agree that uh, we should have this thing stockpiled and this is a potential problem, but having headlines in stat news doesn't help at all. No. It just scares people. The, pe- the regulators who need to stockpile the vaccine aren't reading this. Yeah. So uh, oh, it's just well, it clicks. It's but just, the. They but should, the yeah, but the the way you get a government to respond and hopefully at some point think about planning better is to strike the fear of public backlash into them, mm-hmm. which comes from uh, maybe not letters to congressmen, but but certainly alerting people to the fact that hey, here's a here's another virus that we could have. Well, but prevented. we know they know there's an outbreak. I mean, this is the Michael Osterholm approach to scare people to death. Okay. Right, but you know the, the the regulators know there's an outbreak, and I'm sure this will get made now. Unfortunately, it should have been made before, right? And that's yeah. right. No and matter- I, I don't think I don't think this article is as over the top as we're necessarily making it out to be. It's not it's not a bad article. It actually marks well, the article is okay. The headline and the uh, little quotes by Goobler are just you know worse than SARS. That's, come on, that's come on. much. I wouldn't bl- I wouldn't necessarily blame the reporter for that. I'd like to blame everyone. Well, yes. <laughs> But as I say, if you if you want attention to an issue like this and to get governments to pay attention to it, um, then ultimately you're going to have to get people a little angry about it. You know, Alan, unfortunately, I would like to think that the, that stat and the reporter are you know trying to raise interest, but I think they're just trying to raise clicks. Um, I'd like to think they're trying to do both. 
perhaps. You know, it's like Sanofi, Sanofi needs to make a profit and they're also trying to save yeah, lives. Yeah, I- yeah. Anyway, that was brought to my attention by Nathan on Twitter. It's your fault that we're having this, <laughs> that we're having this discussion. Yes. All right. The next email is from Danny. He writes, hey, Twiv, I want to surface this and see, is surface a new wh- word that we're using? <laughs> is it like interrogate? Yeah, <laughs> I wanted to surface this and see if maybe there's a way we could get a shout out. Experiment is a crowdfunding community and platform for science. 450 projects funded, 50,000 users, 6 million in research funded. Last month was our biggest month yet. Mm. We quickly spun up a new initiative around Zika virus since traditional funding for new projects will take months to be deployed. Deployed, cough, cough, Ebola. We handpick and peer-reviewed 13 projects to launch campaigns for Zika experiments, and the one that ends with the most backers will receive an additional 10000 sponsored by tech investor Ligaya Tishi. It's a small initiative, but the projects are pretty unique, and he gives some of the projects here. In one week, we generated 15,000 page views, 17,000 plus pledged, 404 backers, one project funded. These projects are all picking up press in Brazil, and many of the individual backers are coming from Brazil too. We were recently on this week in Startups, Huh. <laughs> we'd love right. to connect and if there's any way Twiv might help spread the word we'd greatly appreciate it happy to connect with the investigators too alright so guys we're happy to do this but you know you could give us some money too when we could run an ad <laughs> everybody else wants clicks or they want right. money to do this or that so Twiv would love to as well yeah. And you know, you you got money. It doesn't cost a lot to advertise on Twitter, but you got it anyway. You got it for free, okay? Because we're good people. So, Vince, would you take Bitcoin if they gave it to you? Yeah, I'd take it. Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Carly writes, Dear Vincent, and you, may you please share the below announcement for the 17th Annual Microbiology Student Symposium on May 6th, 2016 at the David Brower Center in Berkeley, California with your audience at Twiv, Twip, and Twim. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> I'm a big fan, and I wish I could have attended the uh, MSS when you were a keynote speaker. I was inspired by your interview with Michelle Banks to include microbiology art this year. And mm. Carly sends the announcement. Uh, the microbiology student group at UC Berkeley invites you, presumably all the TWIV listeners, to join them for the 17th Annual Microbiology Student Symposium. That's Friday, May 6th. May 6th. Uh, David Brower. Bra- 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 center in berkeley and this year the keynote speakers are victoria orphan from caltech and michael L- uh, laub from mit sure we'll do it no problem yes yeah, another free ad <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, fine. Uh, yep yep another free L- dixon can you read one i can uh, mariko writes hi twivirons <laughs> okay i just finished listening to episode 380 and wanted to say thank you for talking about a plant virus I'm a graduate student studying plant viruses in the family Luteoviridae at Cornell University. That sounds familiar, Vincent, uh, <laughs> because that's where you went. Uh, where it is gray and 37 degrees slash 3 degrees C this morning. Uh, sounds like it's like that almost all year long. Uh, 12 helps me keep up with the latest in animal virology and motivates me through endless virus purifications. I'm sure you got lots of other emails for plant vir- from plant virologists saying, we're here. But I just wanted to add my uh, virtual voice to the crowd. I hope we'll get to hear m- about more uh, some more plant-related papers soon. Thanks for everything you do. Cheers. Yeah, we, we try and do all viruses here on TWIV. We do. Sure. Uh, Rich, can you take the next one? Sure. Paul writes, Dear TWIV team, I have been listening to TWIV for quite some time now and finally decided to send you my two cents worth. I would just like to comment on your discussion regarding viruses with multipartite genomes. You were talking about cowpea mosaic virus. There are a number of examples of fungal viruses, mycoviruses, that package different segments of their genomic RNAs into multiple capsids. For example, partite viruses, bipartite, and chrysoviruses, which are tetrapartite. This would most likely be an adaptation due to their intracellular transmission by anastomosis, fusion of fungal hyphae, which would ensure that all individually encapsulated genome segments are transmitted to a new host cell. In the majority of cases, microviruses do not appear to run the gauntlet of extracellular transmission. So let me just pause here and point out that the uh, mind boggler in viruses that encapsulate segments in different capsids is that one would think 
uh, and you can demonstrate this experimentally in some systems, that the probability of getting an infected cell would be much, much lower if you have to infect the cell with multiple capsids uh, uh, as compared to uh, one uh, virus particle. Uh, but apparently in this particular case, they, uh, these viruses get around that by uh, transmitting. They don't, they don't have a robust extracellular stage. They transmit by fusion. <clears throat> I've worked on the viruses of fungi while I was a postdoc with Sarah Sawyer. In particular, we have been looking at viruses that chronically infect Saccharomyces cerevisiae, mm -hmm. brewer's yeast, and their antagonistic relationship with host pathways of RNA metabolism. Watch this space for future articles. <laughs> <laughs> I find it unfortunate that many of yeast bi bi biologists do not realize that most laboratory strains of S. cerevisiae are infected by sometimes multiple mycoviruses. Hmm. I have found that leg uh, leveraging the genetics of yeast to do virology is a truly wonderful combination, and I hope to build on this model system in my new lab at the University of Idaho. Nice. Is that the, awesome, is that the awesome genetics? The awesome power of yeast genetics. <laughs> yes. In Pocatello, I presume. Um. Previously, I believe that you have only briefly mentioned mycoviruses on TWIV, but would love to hear you talk more about these fascinating viruses and introduce them to the TWIV audience. Mm -hmm. In TWIV 220, you did mention that you would try to persuade Donald Nuss to come and talk on TWIV. His work on hypoviruses and their impact on fungal disease is truly remarkable and would make an amazing episode. As I recall, we did try to persuade to get Donald Nuss to talk on TWIV, and <laughs> we're unsuccessful. Yeah, he's too scared. <clears throat> um, but Too you're bad. right. We should do this. Well, maybe Paul Ple knows knows enough to tell us yeah, about absolutely. it. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. He knows more than we do. Yes. <laughs> uh, please keep up the inspiring work. Weather, a toasty 47 <laughs> degrees F with scattered cloud here in Moscow, Idaho, which is great considering the snow we've had the last few days. Best. Mm. And I'm going to use the whole name because he's a professor. Paul A. Rowley, Assistant Professor of Department of Biological Sciences, University of Idaho. I gather a fairly brand spanking new Assistant Professor out of Sarah Sawyer's lab. Best of luck. This sounds great. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking of the weather, I um, <laughs> meant to ask you, Alan, I, I follow Paul Dupre on Instagram, and he put a picture up taken at Nantasket Junction, Massachusetts. I don't know where that is. Do you know where that is? Nantasket. Anyway, um, they got like four inches of snow. Oh, yeah, we got snow. You did too? Yes. Oh, did you say that at the beginning? And no, uh, no, that um, <laughs> it's already melted. Oh. Um, so yeah, but we got it, uh, that was that was a few days ago. Um, yeah, we got dumped on, actually it was Monday. Uh, we got we got dumped on, got a few inches of snow. It made the roads all sloppy and slushy, and I had to shovel the driveway. You know, it's April. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> Boston, Boston got uh, Boston got about six inches or so. Uh, my daughter was yeah. there. actually yeah, yeah, it snowed yeah. in Boston while we were there. Since and then then uh, by by Wednesday it was totally gone. It's supposed to snow this weekend too. Yeah, yeah. That's the way it is. That's all just right. the way it is. Uh, I'm driving to uh, Ithaca after this show, ah, so I hope right. it doesn't snow too much. Exactly. I'll be back tomorrow. All right, the next one is from Ed. We only have two more here. Cool. And we can get through them. Hello. Short episode. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Only, <laughs> only an hour and a half. Uh, no, we're already there, so. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, Ed writes, hello, doctors. Twiv, I have enjoyed listening to all of the Twix podcast and it has given me considerable pleasure during my long commute to and from work every day. I was first introduced to TWIM by my microbiology lecture at the University of Leicester, England, and I have now moved to all the Twix podcasts. The nice. team's lamenting about the lack of science knowledge to the general public has even inspired me and a friend to start our own microbiology blog. With both of us being recent graduates from a microbiology degree, we have a decent amount of background knowledge, but shows like Twix have allowed us to further our knowledge, allowing us to spread the good word of science around. I have slowly been working my way through the back catalog of TWIV and have come upon episode <laughs> 278, Flushing HIV Down the Zinc. Love the title, by the way. And found the idea of mutating CCR5 receptors 
fascinating enough to want to write about it on our fledgling blog. I was just wondering if the team was aware of any further studies carried out by these authors or anyone else using this idea and attempting to further the idea or whether it's likely to be just another dead end treatment like so many we have heard of. Thanks again for the entertainment and fount of knowledge that is the Twix podcast. Keep up the good work, Ed. Mm -hmm. So we have moved from zinc nucleases to CRISPRs. Yes. And I think there was a paper recently, uh, which I had intended to do at some point, showing a fellow had uh, had excised CCR5 from, or maybe that was actually the provirus from some infected cells. Um, but I think, yeah, moving forward with CRISPR, Ed, that'll be the way that you can do this. Of course, if you want to take out CCR5, you have to uh, take out T cells from people, then change it, and then put them back in and hope that they take over, right? At least the research remains in the kitchen. Yes. You know, the advances in technology. <laughs> From the zinc to the CRISPR. Yes. Got it. Got it. The, oh, the, <laughs> very good. Sorry. But, um, it's very good. The, the advances in technology are just mind-boggling. And it's so, it's so, in a way, fickle. I mean, imagine all <laughs> of the work that was put into zinc finger nucleases. Yes. I know. To get I these know. things that are specific for various nucleotide pa uh, pairs sure. and, or, and and all of this development and the company development and that <laughs> kind of stuff. And it seems as if it's all being blown away by CRISPR, right? It's all gone. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, well. You know, by the way, um, pro tip for Ed, if you're mentioning your blog, you should provide a link. Yeah, we could give you some free publicity. Yes. <laughs> We're good at that. Yes. You know, we don't make any <laughs> money, but we do give free publicity we have a lot of people listening bump we we make joy Vincent. that's fine I, i'm you just know. you know being a little cranky i would love to have <laughs> enough for example re advertising revenue to get us all to be somewhere to do a live twip someday right nice. sure that's what i'm thinking that's especially nice. number 400 which is coming, coming up that's right. it would be great if we could i could pay for all of you to meet at a central location yep so um maybe we should crowdsource it I'm actually planning to do a Patreon thing, oh. and and uh, you know one of these days when I have a little spare time, I'll do that. But um, yeah, we'll we'll raise. Have money. a contest to see who can raise the most money to have the 400th episode in their neighborhood. <laughs> in their neighborhood, that's a <laughs> that's good right. idea. Buy us, buy us all bus tickets to Norwalk, Ohio. <laughs> we'll have a bake sale. <laughs> a bake sale would be great. That's good, Alan. Can you take the next one? Sure. Anthony um, sends a link, and this is quoting an article from 1967 by Marshall McLuhan and George Leonard, which was called The Future of Education, the Class of 1989. <laughs> and the quote is, uh, the world communications net, the all-involving linkage of electric circuitry, will grow and become more sensitive. It will also develop new modes of feedback so that communication can become dialogue instead of monologue. It will breach the wall between in and out of school. It will join all people everywhere. When this has happened, we may at last realize our place of learning is the world itself, the entire planet we live on. <laughs> the little red schoolhouse is already well on its way toward becoming the little round schoolhouse. <laughs> Someday, all of us will spend our lives in our own school, the world. And education, in the sense of learning to love, to grow, to change, can become not the woeful preparation for some job that makes us less than we could be, but the very essence, <laughs> the joyful whole of existence itself. Wow. Goodness Which is gracious. just just a glorious, wonderful dose from the past of what we we were supposed to have in the future. Yep. And now you can all go check your Facebook feeds and see how it <laughs> <is>. <laughs> Uh Concluding this email, by the way, Carl Zimmer mentioned on TWIV Craigslist extracting the tiger from the newspaper's tank. Here's what McLuhan wrote in 64. Quote, the classified ads and stock market quotations are the bedrock of the press. Should an alternative source of easy access to such diverse daily information be found, the press will fold. <laughs> mm. Boy, he was a smart guy. Correct. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Nailed that one. The previous prediction was a little off, but this one, yeah. Well, in theory, he was right about the, the education, but it just hasn't yes. happened, it's right? It's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, stuck with, you know, people being people. Mm -hmm. All right, our last... Is, a, is just a link sent by Richard to a white paper. Um, I don't know if it's from, I guess it from, comes from Kyogen, but it's got a little Intel thing on the upper right. It says, analyzing whole genomes, 
human genomes for as little as $22. So basically, Kaijin and Intel have put together a um, cluster architecture that makes it cheaper to analyze genome sequences. Wow. They assume, assuming 700 gigabytes of data for a whole genome at 30x coverage, uh, this requires more than uh, ter- 30 terabytes of data analysis per day. <laughs> and this takes a long time. So they figured out how to get it, 22 bucks. So that's good because, in fact, um, bioinformatics, or what is it, uh, Rich? Not computational, computational biology. biology. Sorry, uh, Eugene Coonan. <laughs> it's, exp- it's expensive. It takes a lot of computing time. So that's cool. Gattaca is here. Okay. It is. It's here. You bet. Who right, wants to go to Titan? <laughs> I'd go as long as I can get back. Uh, you wouldn't want right. to go to Titan. I don't want to stay there. <laughs> you want to swim in those methane lakes? You know, they want people to volunteer to go to Mars and stay there. I know, I know. That's, hey, that's Dixon, maybe they have ice fishing in those methane lakes. <laughs> right, that's right. Oh, that's man. Right. I don't want to go and not come back. That would be scary, you know? Yeah. Exactly. All right, let's do some picks. Got it. Alan, what do you have? I have a video contest, um, and this is a contest that's sponsored by the National Adult and Immunization Influenza Su- National Adult and Influenza Immunization Summit. Um, this is a, a group that organizes. It's sort of one of these meta organizations. It's gets together organizations that are involved in immunizing people, and they have an annual summit meeting that's coming up in Atlanta in May. Um, I'm, I'm on their email list. I'm not going to the meeting, but they're doing this video contest. So a lot of their partners have um, have put together videos, little one-minute videos, uh, to promote the idea that adults need vaccines too. And these range from fairly fairly rough student efforts to fairly professional corporate efforts. And you can go ahead and take a look at them. The way you vote is you go on YouTube and you log in and just pick the one you like best and give it a thumbs up. Nice. That's great. Actually, they don't even specify you have to only pick one. So you can you could do them all. You could like multiple ones. And then they'd all win. Chicago voting. Vote early, vote often. <laughs> Dixon, right. Dixon, go check them out. I will. Yeah. Dixon, what's your pick? Uh, well, it was an article that appeared in the New York Times a Sunday before last in the business section. And I happen to know these two ladies very well because we interviewed them on urban agriculture. And it's all about the opening of a new vertical farm in Jackson, Wyoming. So Didn't you pick this last week? I don't think so. Okay. No, no. I picked uh, something completely different last week. And this uh, this will be – this uh, this is going to get – big i can tell you now this what, is vertical going, farming what they're doing uh, they're <laughs> empowering people that are developmentally uh, challenged to work in these farms is that right yeah that's right i think i remember that from our interview yeah yeah, yeah. so people with down syndrome for instance and some high functional artistic people can uh, get jobs whereas that's ordinarily great. they can't so that's that's my pick so they quote you in this article they do they call you mr de pommier that's okay i got because a new york- you know the new york times will not call you <laughs> doctor unless you're an md it doesn't bother me at all <laughs> but what is that about give me a break i don't know you have to ask that bloody new york times i got a new york times bump on my book sales though you did yeah you amazon will? went from 200,000th to 28,000th. Wow. Very good, Dixon. Yeah, that means two books were sold. I, I don't know how those numbers are generated. <laughs> do you want to take out an ad on Twiv, Dixon? I would love to take an ad. <laughs> sure, I'll do it. <laughs> how much? <laughs> we'll, talk. we'll talk. Yeah, we can talk. We can talk. You know, the, the thing about running ads is you have to send invoices, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's all true. And then you have to be able to collect it. So, yeah. So we I'll send Guido ads. around you to collect. We, we did ads for Mount Sinai. And a, a software company, yeah. right? Yeah. And I sent, the, so two years later, I sent the invoice to Mount Sinai. Oh, and the guy said, did we do this? I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, I, so I sent him his original email. He said, well, no wonder. It's two years. We'll see what we can do. And then the company, I sent an invoice. They never answered. So there All you right. go. Right. Oh, boy. I know. It's tough. Uh, it's tough. Rich, what do you have? Uh, I have an oldie but goodie, uh-huh. uh, and that is the science fiction novel Dune. Oh, <laughs> Great right. book. By Frank Herbert. I yeah. was thinking about it because I've been reading some science fiction lately that's okay, and I was tempted to uh, pick, and then I thought to myself, you know, what's like really good science fiction? <laughs> I think Dune may be the best science fiction novel ever written. Really? And there are, there are others who, uh, who agree 
It won both the Hugo and the Nebula Award. It's from, like, this is shocking, 1968. <laughs> so this thing is nearly 50 years old. I remember reading it in college and being absolutely riveted. And if, if you're tempted to be in, interested and you've seen the movie and you are not, and the movie turned you off, then don't let that deter you because no. the book is much better. And, and, and when you read the book, you'll see why. It's, it's just, it's so huge, it's unfilmable. <laughs> now, yeah. Absolutely. So much happens Absolutely. in the characters' heads that you, yeah. It's just, yeah. it's just a terrific book. Now, Alan, have you read the sequels? Because there's a total of five of these. No, I only read the one. I only read the one. Uh, I don't know much about uh, the sequels, but it's tempting. Actually, I think I would have to reread the one before I went back to Maybe I'll do that. There you go. <laughs> Come I mean, on, you're an emeritus professor years. now, yeah, Rich. You've got all this yeah, time. you got the time. <laughs> what a good idea. Okay, that's my pick. Go read it. It's a great book. Muadib. Yes. Oh, great it's book. It's a great book. Um, and I agree, it's really good. I've recently read one of the Foundation books by uh, Asimov, and those are pretty good, too. Oh, yeah. I think I picked those some time ago. Yeah. I, I don't know. I know I, we talked about the robot novels as well. I read Prelude to Foundation, which was written after the original uh -huh. Foundation, right? And I just found that wonderful. And then I went to the next one, and I didn't think it was as good for some reason. Yeah. But Science fiction was always my... Um, procrastinatory uh, activity when I was uh, approaching exams. Mm. So I read Dune uh, in exam period in, as an undergraduate, and I read the Foundation Trilogy uh, in exam period during graduate school. Mm. Nice. All right, my pick is a, um, an article written by the new president of the American Society for Microbiology. Actually, he's the CEO, okay, because they have a headquarters building in Washington with a staff and he's he's kind of like the head of that so he's the CEO not to confuse him with the elected president who this year of course is Lynn Enquist right so his name is Stefano Bertuzzi he came over from I think the American Society for Cell Biology and recently joined ASM so he's starting a weekly blog which he calls blog phase mm. and uh, the first article which he sent to everybody today is called preprint publication, the force awakens or revenge of the undead. <laughs> so I'm really glad he's, <laughs> he's plugged into pop culture. Really good sign, right? <laughs> anyway, this is all about preprint servers and he goes through, you know, what's happening in this field, what he thinks about it and so forth. Talks about the physicists who do it. Now, the cool thing is, you know, we all have talked about the archive uh, server, bio archive at Cold Spring Harbor, right? Turns out he's one of the uh, board of directors of that. Mm. <laughs> and I have heard that he's trying to do something with ASM of that sort, have a preprint server so that when you submit a paper to one of the ASM journals, it just goes up on the preprint server first. That would be very interesting, wouldn't it? Mm. So everybody could see it. Yes. So he's really behind this, and I suggest you take a look at this if you're interested in that. Um there's never been a scientific age as exciting nor as quickly evolving as our own. And here at ASM, we are determined to play a significant role in the acceleration of microbial sciences. So you should subscribe to it because he's going to be writing every week. It's pretty this cool. Is, I have to say, this is a very open-minded uh, view for somebody who's running a, yeah. an academic society that makes money off subscription journals. And I should say most of their money is made from sus subscription journals. And I will leave yeah. it as an exercise to the class to compare other scientific societies that run subscription journals and consider how they feel about things like preprints and yeah. open access. Yeah, that's very good that he's embracing it. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of listener picks. One is from Ken Stedman, Portland State, who's been on TWIV. Dear TWIV Swarm, I prefer that to plaque. <laughs> Great show with Carl Zimmer. Pity you did not get to talk about Planet of Viruses, which is an excellent and quite short read for both virologists and non-virologists. Based on that episode, I have a bit of a shameless and somewhat self-serving pick from the Golden Mole Award for Accidental Brilliance that was sponsored by <laughs> NPR. Our research was featured in the top 12 and even made the top 5 video, and he gives links for these. <laughs> Whoops, 12, 12 Tales of Accidental Brilliance in Science. So his is number 12, all the way, and this is some nice photos here. 
Um, is it number 12? No. What did he say it was? Number five. Yeah, actually, yeah, number 11. Yeah, we wound the video up in was the top five. five. Video was, was five, but on this 12. list, top 12. viruses in glass houses. Hmm. So uh, he was. Um, hmm. <laughs> uh, yes, it's a very interesting. So it's all about knowing when viruses. you've been lucky. Is that the idea? He wants to know if you could find viruses in fossils. So they were making um, an artificial hot spring in his lab, and they became coated with uh. vir- with silica, and uh, it wasn't great, but. It was cool. So read it. And I, I think I remember him telling us this story. Uh, the winner is from the University of Michigan. That should please Kathy. But the whole process is a nice example of how serendipity works in a whole bunch of different areas of science. On the flip side, the announcement of the winner was supposed to be broadcast during morning edition on NPR March 1. But in many broadcast areas, including mine, it was superseded by coverage of Super Tuesday presidential primary so most people got only to see here to online i think that speaks to the newsworthiness of science unfortunately mm-hmm. keep up the amazing work you're all inspirational ken ps i just got a 3d printed model of my favorite <laughs> virus and it's very cool except i like the virus ken but you have to smile <laughs> so i uh, i look, look at I that look at that these. oh my gosh he's so serious yeah, I looked at all these, and they're really pretty cool. And the thing I like best is, this is a quote I think we've uh, hosted before. It's the uh, Isaac Asimov once wrote, quote, the most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries is not eureka, but that's funny. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I love it's, that. It's funny you should bring that, that up, that's because funny. next week's Quiv, <laughs> because I'll be away next week, I will be running a canned episode, which we, Jixon and I did this week with Stuart Firestein, oh, yeah. and he yes. brought up that quote. Yeah, yeah. Stuart has written a new book called Failure, which follows his first book called Ignorance. Ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> so he teaches a course in on ignorance, ignorance and, and failure. I wonder if he, exactly. I, we asked him if he was going to teach a course in failure and what the grades would be. And right. He said, actually, it's part of ignorance already. <laughs> <laughs> you should listen. It's pretty fun. All right. Our last listener pick is from Jim, who writes, Pavel Grinfeld of Drexel University offers an introductory course on linear algebra on YouTube. The above link is the first of three parts of over 200 lectures. Good heaven. These lectures are exceptional and fun. He's an excellent teacher and a careful presenter. Most lectures are in digestible size of about five minutes. Ah, which if you, is why they're 200. Yes, right. If you have any interest in the handling of big data or if you have had a course in linear algebra and did not enjoy it, this is a good <laughs> course to look at. I fall in the latter category. You, you didn't enjoy I want, it? I want one on just no, algebra. I, <laughs> just algebra, Dixon. Really yeah, let's start at the beginning, shall we? <laughs> When I retire, Dixon, actually I'll never retire, no, but don't retire. when I stop running a lab, yes. my goal is to uh, redo all be of my... Cremated? Ver- Sorry? Be cremated? No. <laughs> no, I, I don't really care what's done with me afterwards. Um, I want to make all my virology classes into five-minute lectures, ah. exactly like this, but nicely animated and, and fun, ah. and that would take a lot of time, so I can't do it now. Mm. That will be my legacy to virology. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, all right. You shouldn't say things like that. All right. This is TWIV. You can find it at iTunes, micro.tv slash TWIV. Also, you can get it on your favorite podcatcher. You know, there are all kinds of apps for iPhones and Androids that you can grab podcasts on now. And check it out and send us your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. Especially Dixon. Send him comments and questions. All of them. I'll answer yeah. everyone individually. TWIV at microbe.tv. Dixon de Pommier is here uh, yes. at Columbia, but he's also at verticalfarm.com. Thank you, Dixon. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Did you enjoy this episode? Had a great time. Excellent. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. How long are you home for? <laughs> uh, well, I have a couple of small trips, but the next big one isn't until uh, ASV. Uh, middle of June. So uh, actually, yeah, a couple of small trips, but ASV, middle of June, and then right after that, uh, me and my skipper are going to sail to the Bahamas. Nice. Are Which you- Bahama? Uh, uh, I, well, yes. I don't know yet. I don't know yet. There's a, uh, I, I do know, but I don't know. I'd have to look it up. There's a race series that goes on, and I forget where it starts. Well, don't get stuck in the triangle. That's all I can tell you. 
Okay. <laughs> you and I are going to be at Penn State. Um, That's that, correct. Right? That's one of the trips. Right. And actually, that trip gets extended because I'm going to go from there to Austin. But that's only a week. If I'm gone for a week, I don't count that as gone. <laughs> <laughs> the only time I count you as gone is when you're not on TWIV. Right. Yeah, there you go. Right. All right. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. You can also find him on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>